Hello Believers, welcome to the podcast. You probably know the deal by now, but if you don't, this is a podcast where we speak to creative people about what they do, how they think, and what they think of the X-Files. It is raining here in Edinburgh, very drizzly, and not at all like the sunny pastel coloured climes of Miami. Um, We'll get on to why I've mentioned that shortly. For those wondering, Moose the dog is totally fine after his surgery. He did not like that cone on his head though, which they put on there to stop him licking his wounds. Yeah, I pulled that off a couple of times, so we had to pop him in a pair of my four-year-old son's pyjama bottoms at one point, uh, try and gaffer tape those on, and then um, that didn't work, so we tried him with a nappy uh, before we eventually took him back to the vets uh, the morning after. And they provided him with a bright blue surgery shirt. So now he looks like a member of the Paw Patrol. Very stylish. Well done, Moose. Uh, Just taking him out on a short lead until he gets back to full speed. I should say, uh, briefly, before we get on to the chat, shout out to the Gladiators. Congratulations on all your success. I love the fact that that show has done so well uh, since it came back. It's just something very brilliantly British about it kind of 90s nostalgia and end of the pier violence and pantomime uh, as well as an array of well built folk in tight outfits Uh, and all shot in Sheffield so good on you Steel City. On to today's guest and in many ways they say uh, San Francisco is the Sheffield of America I don't know who says that actually that's probably more like Detroit isn't it but anyway No need for a jokey segue because today's guest is the San Francisco-based artist and musician Dan Davies. Dan studied at Goldsmiths College and has had solo exhibitions at Bass and Reiner in San Francisco and the Folk Gallery in London. In addition, he's participated in group exhibitions entitled Pyramid Scheme and The Long Look and is also part of the London Summer Mix at the Terps Gallery in London. I really, really enjoyed this chat with Dan and uh, catching up with him. Not only is he a brilliant artist, but he's also a massive Michael Mann fan, so gear up for lots of Mann chat on this. As well as that, Dan talks about what makes something an art object and what makes something a prop. 80s interiors, Fassbinder's World on a Wire, uh, The Curse, the thriving and supportive art scene in San Francisco, and um, another man we talk about is X-Files Season 1, Episode 18, Miracle Man. I hope you get a lot out of this chat. Dan gave me so many great recommendations uh, for X-Files related stuff and non-X-Files related stuff. Uh, so I'll put those in the links for this episode afterwards so you can have a look at those. As always, if you like the show, do please like and subscribe, tell your friends. Oh, I should say, I'm trying to... Um, pressure my mother into knitting me a X-Files jumper so if you know my mother just mention that uh, she's given me some bullshit about it being out of a skill set but um, I don't know come on come on mum get on board for the big win eh anyway here we go here's Dan I've been like five years or something like that, but then I don't know with COVID and everything and also the fact that we kind of stay in touch on WhatsApp. Yeah. I don't know, you, you guys are kind of always in our consciousness, so <laughs> That's nice. it's weird. Yeah. I don't really think about like time in general nowadays is all a bit skewed, but um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm good. We just got back from uh, Finland. Yeah, we were going to go, yeah, during, like, Christmas, but it, it, it was like, uh, just kind of expensive and a bit hectic, so, mm. you know, they always say the best time to go to Finland is, like, late January, early February. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like a true detective, it's like, a yeah, d- darkness, um, but the, uh, the coldness is, is, it was real at least in, in Finland, because it was like, 
I think Fahrenheit. I don't know. Like I can't remember what. What do you do? Celsius. Yeah. So what's cold for us? Well, like zero. <laughs> you know. But the thing, like with Leith, is uh, there's a wind that blows through, and uh, and it just chills you to the bone. And yeah. my mum's boyfriend's here is a little convoluted way of saying it. Someone we know from Australia came over, and it wasn't even that cold, and they were like having a nervous breakdown about how cold it was <laughs> because it was like because it's damp as well and i think that makes you feel cold makes the heat like especially like uh even when you're inside for some reason when it's like a damp cold it like affects it seems to affect that mm. but it was like celsius i think it was like minus 30 around minus 22 fahrenheit <sighs> It's just like, <laughs> and and it's one thing like like where I grew up. I grew up in Iowa. It's just kind of mm. like uh, you've been in a, in and around there, and you're like tornado missions. But like when I explain it, what it looked like in the winter to people who don't know, it, it's kind of like Fargo. Yes, it's like a frozen shithole, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so were you? I was, I was obviously googling you before we chatted. And were you born in Indiana then? And did do you folks move to? Yeah, I was born in Indiana. Um, my parents are from Cleveland. They kind of slowly made their way: Cleveland, Michigan, Indiana, mm. and then we ended up in Iowa. So I don't know. Slowly made our way to the center. I was going to say, is that was that? Did you move for work? Was that for your folks' work that you moved there? Yeah, yeah. My dad, like uh, he. He was like in the early, early days of selling like computer networking systems. This is like pretty weird. Like, but he he actually like uh, after college he he kind of got like a job, like a random job, like running the the street lights of a neighborhood and and like outside of town of Cleveland, like right. <laughs> by, by running by just keeping this computer uh, like main mainframe size of a room like keeping it ticking over right and it was kind of for him like you know it was a bit of a hippie like it was a way to keep doing easy job i guess right. <laughs> and uh and then somehow just like managed to get into computers that way but like i bet you can get quite nerdy about that can't you like the sort of intricacies of keeping lights on at a certain time especially in the early days of computing i bet there was a lot of like data wrangling and uh, looking at the numbers and the figures and efficiency, and I bet you could get really into it. You know, it's, yeah, it's hard to hard to imagine. Like, uh, it's almost like a completely different thing because we're so like removed from the the what's actually happening inside nowadays. Mm. Like, so so far removed from that. But I think he I think he was saying it was punch cards, and I think he got fired. <laughs> Because he didn't, uh, he he like spaced off going there. Like, I think they were late nights, and I think he just like I don't know, hung out with his friends or something. I don't know what, but like, <laughs> like just spaced it off, and then the lights went out, and like he he like got, right. got sacked. So. You had one job, Derek. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, he somehow got got into like that, and then Michigan, Indiana, and then I think he. He wanted to go from selling the computer systems to those folks to like um, to having like a a dealership himself and his friend, and so that's what brought them to Iowa, brought us there, and then that's kind of where we ended up staying and grew up and everything. Right. And I think they were also really um, they had more of like a city upbringing, and I think the idea for him appealed appealed to. Uh, the kind of open space and the freedom of we could just go do what we wanted and yeah. and the education I think was the schools at the, that, that time were like nationally quite good so but it yeah it ended up being true because like growing up we just kind of roamed around the fields and nice. saw big insects and <laughs> swam in yeah. creeks that were probably like full of pesticides I don't know um, so was he? You said he was a bit of a hippie. Was he the one that sort of introduced art to you, and and, and where did that come from? And when did this is three questions in one? At what point did you think that's what I want to do with well, my life? Well, I think music definitely. Um, 
mm. came from him. I, I remember like one of my earliest memories of like music in a really direct way, um, rather than it being like you know the the background of your life or whatever. It, it was a, uh, I think he was babysitting us. I think it was kind of like, hey, you're looking after the kids today. And the way one of his techniques was to sit us all down in front of the you know the hi-fi system, and because in those days it was like that's. That was the, like the the goal to have like a really nice receiver and tape deck. It was like a whole thing, you know. Sit us down in front of that, and then we get we all take turns getting a chance to listen to the headphones. And and I might be inventing this memory, but I I think like it was like Pink Floyd, like the Wall or something, like oh, something wow. really spacey. And like I don't know what he was thinking, but like. <laughs> You know, and but we would it would it really worked because we would all be like we would all be patiently waiting, like mm. with our kind of backs to the wall, just kind of twiddling our thumbs, waiting for our chance to get to listen to the, to the music. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I don't know. Like, and then he played. You know, he he played music. Um, he was in a bunch of bands, like in high school, college, and um, you know, you know, you'd always share stories every once in a while and. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think I just got into it through that. But the the visual art part of it wasn't. There wasn't anyone. I have an uncle who's a ceramicist and a, and a painter. Right. He lived really far away. He lived in like kind of upstate New York, and uh, I didn't really see him much. So it wasn't like an active influence in my life. But I think I just always, you know, always always was drawing and like. That was just like my quiet time, you know, like my my yeah. time, my way of like going within myself, I guess. What were you drawing then? Were you doing like landscapes? Yeah, and anything people? and everything. Like, um, if I see anything I didn't understand, I guess I would draw it, like a motorcycle engine or a football American football helmet. You know, it wouldn't yeah. be like the the people. It would be like the stuff. You know, like. Like, my brother would be drawing a picture of, like, the player, you know, and I'd be drawing the helmet, <laughs> the different <laughs> kinds of helmets, you know, because they'd all yeah. have different, like, face masks or whatever. And so, I don't know. And then and then I was always, I guess, good at it when in terms of, like, other kids would be like, can you draw me this? Can you draw me that? Or, like, if we had, like, a, um, I remember my first art accolade was, like, the officer-friendly safe poster like safety poster contest right it was like it was like such a good scene like you'll get a kick out of it it was like a a, a person you know like some stick figure people like in a car and then yeah. one person hanging out the window holding like a lollipop scent and then the kids a group of kids and then the person in the car said hey kids get in the car and i'll give you candy <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it was yeah like to teach the lesson of like because of what the officer friendly had come to the school and talk to a, talk to the kids about safety and that's what I yeah. that was like my takeaway and I really en- encapsulated it in like <laughs> yeah a whole theme is that a, is that a thing then is that was that his name officer friendly or was it is that like a term of someone who comes into school like and teaches you about i don't know if they still do it but that was you know the the 80 1980s middle american yeah. police industrial complex uh, indoctrination <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, yeah so i mean who's who is he friendly to i'm not sure yeah right i mean when i look at your stuff now is it fair to say that there's i know you i know you're to a certain extent you'd like the aesthetic of the 80s and we've spoke about Miami Vice and that look but what is it about you know the, those interiors and that time and space that sort of captivates you is there something that you could put your finger on about the 80s that you think that's what I find exciting about it and I want to process I think a lot of it is um there's there's quite a few things I mean I try and figure that out I don't really have a great answer but one thing I'd say is, um, I think looking looking back at the past kind of offers you the ability. You have enough removed to kind of 
see how it, it it's kind of operated, how it, mm-hmm. how it has been operating, rather than like more current culture. It, it's still like the jury's kind of still out, and yeah. um, and I think like the the eighties were like a really definitive time um, where there, like status meant so much in in like dominant American culture. I think like if you watch like most films from then. There's so like, so many of the films from, from that time are about the different power structures with money. Like even like, mm. I don't know, like Karate Kid, you know, he's like a, a working class kid from, you know, working class neighborhood against the kind of like rich kids. And they're, you know, like th- that story is kind of played out in like so many of the, of the films and yeah. stories, the narratives of the time. And I think with the interior spaces, like I, I think like they give me an opportunity to um, to compare sort of values of things like high and low and and in and out of time, like kind of like I, I really like to think think of uh, uh, for a while I was thinking about like what's a, like a legitimate like art object and versus like kind of like a prop. Because right. I think what was interesting to me about like going through, I think I, I went through like, I watched every episode of Miami Vice kind of like 10 mm-hmm. years ago as kind of like a side project and kind of documented all the artworks that are in the background. Right. And the, and the, th- the reason around that is because I was noticing that sometimes, um, and I also recommend uh, like separately like World on a Wire by Rainer Renner. Fastbender. Uh, oh yes, I've I've never done that. I think you, we've actually got it on DVD somewhere, but I, I've not I'm not committed to that yet. But. Yeah, go for that one because um, and there's also like a really good on I think I think Canopy. I don't know if you have that here or there, there. but Canopy is like a, a channel here that is kind of goes with your with your library subscription. Right. So you can do streaming there. So for people in North America, there's a um, there's actually a documentary on the making of World on on a wire oh fantastic and that's good because it talks about the set design and, and i think what i wanted to say about that was is that thing of like uh art objects and their value what i'm trying to say is that like when you sometimes when you unintentionally or don't try as hard on making an artwork it ends up being better than like more, more resonant to people uh than the ones that you like spend a lot of time and invest a lot of yourself into and right. and so that there's that kind of like set dressing kind of like a uh, casual way of creating art objects that in film that i think are really telling just about object making in general mm-hmm. and um that world on a wire is a good example because you know that was like seventy, I think seventy two, and and and, and it, it's really amazing because it's like the plot of the Matrix, pretty much. <laughs> right. Okay. Go, yeah, about going into the computer and like living in a world in there, and that's before you know like Snow Crash or Neuromancer or like any of those. Yeah. And um, but they didn't have that kind of budget or the means, even you know that te- kind of technology didn't exist. So like the the visual signifiers for the future and other and uh, cyber world were just kind of ordinary things but with like you know mirrors put on them or like a right. there's like there's like an octagonal mirrored plinth and it just has like a cowboy hat on it and it's right this is like just random it's like kind of randomness and 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 i guess it's like you know what would the future be like it would be like this but different and some things mm. would be some things would still be there but their meanings would change so this is like really long-winded way of talking around it but i don't i don't have like a specific thing but i think it's just that i, I try and think of visual ways that give me opportunity to talk about these things and, and interiors are a way to do that more you know more readily because um, yeah. then, once you start getting outside, then it really locates it with you within a place. Like, oh, were those mountains? Are those the Alps? Are those the Rocky Mountains? Is that the sea? Is that the ocean? Is that a lake? You know, it starts to get more 
specific. Yeah, and this work person like way of approaching how are we going to show the future? We're going to we we've not got a budget or we've not um you know, we've not got the means to show craft or whatever flying around. Uh, we're going to show it by a cowboy hat on a plinth, you know, and there's definitely let's say true detective I, I'm, I'm watching that thinking you just because you can do these things and show these things doesn't mean you should and it's artistically more interesting to be confined by you know uh budgets or timings and you know do we need to see um a herd of uh reindeer jumping off a cliff i don't think we do i think you we could, that could be film i think it's a lopez is an interesting filmmaker but maybe it's the confines that the studio said we need to show this it's a big opening montage or whatever we need to we need a big opening but there's a lot of that show in particular where i think had this been made by yeah michael mann in the 80s there would have been some different choices in there which when we look back in you know, twenty years time will will still still appear classic. You know, because if you look back at obviously one of my f- favorite films is another Michael Mann film, Manhunter. That still that seems very much of its time, but it's still it's it almost in another universe. It's rooted in reality, but it's it's this kind of dreamlike because of the characters, because of uh, the. St- Siri the Tooth Fairy and the whole things about his dreams and he's seeing his fantasy in his dreams. Um, that plays into what the you know that what the visuals are, but that's that's so much more rewatchable. You know, I I watch that film every every six months, every year. You know, uh, and go back to it and see some see something else in it. But I, I probably I don't know. I, I try and avoid sounding like a boring grumpy old fart on this podcast but it's, it's difficult sometimes well i think yeah. i think a really good example of that is i think you know like manhunter it, you know compare that to like i think it's one of the sequels of the silence of the lambs where mm. it has uh what's his name the norwegian actor with the incredible face um he was in the bomb He's maybe Danish. Oh, Mads Mikkelsen. Yeah, there's the one where there's that one, and then there's like this really gory scene at a dinner setting, and then. Oh yes, that's Hannibal, isn't it? Yeah. So like, so like, okay, like take that versus Manhunter, like, like that has like this just completely disgusting like CGI scene, right? And yeah. it's 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 less to me even scary. It's just more like uh, cu- curious, you know? Mm. It's like oh. Was he wearing like um, on his head like a green, like you know, hat? Or, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, how, how they did it. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And then when I watch Manhunter, like I'm absolutely like horrified and you know, frightened by this guy who's always wearing is like a, a kind of nylon stocking on his face, mm. and I'm like, he's scary. You know, <laughs> he's in my nightmares, and it's like, why? Why is that different? And it's just like the the whole of it the atmosphere maybe the thing you can't like some x factor you can't put your finger on but it's not yeah it's not relying on some other device it's like it's built into the dna of the thing it's totally interesting watching the uh red dragon because manhunter is from the book red Dra- thomas harris book red dragon and then the uh the red dragon film with not Brian Cox, Sandable Lecter, but um, Anthony Hopkins after Science of the Lambs. And um, it's just any nuance or, I don't know, I was going to say joy I found in the in Manhunter has just totally evaporated. Everything's spelled out and there's no room for ambiguity. And like you say, it's not scary. It's even more... Because I, I I watch Science of the Lambs and I think it's quite camp, you know, yeah, it kind is, of yeah. water sort of way. Because you've got, the it's it's very, Hopkins's performance is really scenery chewing and it's f- operatic, you know, histrionics all over the place and big score and all that, and uh, and that's what they basically tried to recreate with with Red Dragon to 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 dreadful sort of. Effect. But the funny thing is, it's it's shot by Dante Spignotti, who shot Manhunter. 
So imagine shooting Manhunter. I mean, I don't mind saying one of the greatest films ever made and then coming back to make the same film again in 25 years' time and just shooting it. I mean, quite an interesting exercise, actually, shooting it in a totally different way, obviously a different script. Um, But I do feel like part of me died slightly when I thought, who shot this? And it's like, oh, Dante. (laughs) Just retire, mate. You're all right. One thing I also want to say about Manhunter is uh, it... It also like speaks really a lot. It speaks a lot to what I'm trying to say about these kind of interiors and and mm-hmm. and, and why they they kind of matter to me. Near the end, one of the end scenes when they actually go to the killer's like place, like his yeah. residence, it is like one of the most beguiling kind of interiors. Like it doesn't make any sense. There are like these panels. I think there's like four or five like kind of like 10 foot tall panels in, in, in the background and they've got like like a print of like the moonscape yeah it's like I think it's Mars isn't it it's like it's Mars like, yeah, yeah yeah like why like totally no <laughs> yeah. reason like and it's just like oh this is like this person is playing with, on a, with a completely different set of rules like mm. in his own interior space and his own way of occupying the world and I think there's, and for some reason it's not spoken to, like it's not a direct, uh, it's implied, you know, and yeah. it's like, it's an ambient temperature of the, of the film, you know, and, but you're making those kind of connections. Oh, this is a scary place because it's like, who, who lives like that, you know? Sure. Yeah. Who configures yeah, their interior world in this way? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, this the Halloween and the Halloween series and how that new trilogy has picked and choosed bits of the mythology and really tried to heighten them what the killer Michael Myers means. He's now basically turned into the devil, symbolizing that he's like pure evil. But you go back to the original film and you know John Carpenter, who was again you know, who was an old hippie. You know, he's he was like, well, why why have we got in a why have we got the killer in a white mask? It looks scary. That and that's that yeah, the end. exactly. It was just it's a like, one dimensional thing. Get, it's like, can you go and get you know a mask? And then the mask they brought back was this William Shatner mask, paint that white. Great, right on we go. And Is that right? Yeah, and they just they oh my God. they they don't. Uh, there's no need to explain it. The more you explain it, the less sort of weird and uncanny and strange it is but i just love that this kind of recontextualization of these new films that it was all a big plan and uh you know carpenter meant all this and he you know he totally wasn't it was like i'm trying to make a a film trying to make a couple of quid look we've got some money to make this film let's make a horror film because people like that um and he, you know, it just struck. It's the kind of alchemy of. What, I'm not saying he's not talented, but the alchemy of that those set of people at that time, in this kind of post uh, Vietnam sort of that probably that was more takes a chainsaw, but you know that kind of world. It all aligned cosmically to create this one film, and it just it's not possible to recreate that again you know it's just so just let's leave it and let's not try and rinse any last bit of money or intrigue or interest out of this bloody film please you know i'm still I blown away that the, the mask was like such a casual decision i guess that's what i mean is it's like sometimes those things land like a lot a lot more than you'd expect them to like these just like kind of like casual chance chance like visual choices can just yeah. can just totally work but you can you can wring your hands over a choice like that and then have it amount to nothing so it's, like the energy that you put into these choices are, are not they don't like uh guarantee the kind of return <laughs> and i guess to that do you feel like you're part of a scene do you feel like a painter who's part of a scene or do you feel a kind of 
kinsmanship to other artists or do you very much feel like you're on your own and you know you've mentioned your influences and that but are there people you see and you go that person's on my wavelength or um is it purely just you're just doing what you do and then you know you occasionally stumble on people who are, have got the same similar minds i think when we were in in london i think there were more there were just more artists around um mm-hmm. this is a bigger much bigger scene but um but i had you know i have like really like strong kind of connections to people i've known for like kind of 20 years or so since grad school who i i feel like really connected to in that way as as painters um Mm -hmm. my friend i always i always like rely on you know the kind of input from a friend of mine william weisman um he's like an incredible painter um based in london um Mm -hmm. dutch painter based in london um so you know listeners to check out his work and then and then in general like i mean there's plenty of artists painters who whose work i know but don't know who are you know famous not famous whatever um who i i kind of like feel like i share some kind of bits with um uh but but in general i think you can look at other art too much i think and um one thing I've kind of appreciated about living away from London in, in a kind of smaller art hub of San Francisco is that I'm not like constantly around. I'm not like in London, I feel like you're hyper aware of the market <laughs> and like right. w- what's hot and what's not, what's being shown at the top galleries, what's not, what's, what's the trend or whatever. And I think that that can all like really cloud your decision making, whether, whether or not like you even realize it or not i really mm. tend to like when i'm making work like right now I'm, I'm focusing on like a new body of work and i'm like in that phase of just trying to conjure it you know out of kind of nothing and to me that's yeah. like that's the hardest part like this part the, ex- the execution the time that i spend painting although it's not easy has challenges of its own it's it's a lot it's a lot less fraught when you know what you're doing every day like i'm gonna work on that painting i'm gonna work on that painting how do you how does that work then that process do you do you go from scribbling in a in a sketchbook to you know a canvas quite quickly or or do you do you start just freewheeling on a canvas or uh, talk me through that kind of process is there a point when you go Right now, I know what I'm doing. Do you plan it all out in your head beforehand, or, or, or is there an, an element of improvisation with it? You know, it starts off like I, I, for me, it's important that I have a, the concept of the thing, um, mm. and it doesn't have to be a big, you know, big overarching thing. It could just be like I, I want to make a painting of a styrofoam wig head. <laughs> and and uh, so uh, like and, 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 and the reason why is it, it, I feel like my practice is generative and um, it's important to me that it is because I want to like I want to make as many I want to generate as much work as I possibly can because you know I only I might not like everything that I make like if I make five paintings I might like three or three of them you know like so I want to practice that's like building a on the last thing so like you know i I was uh early on i was made a lot of figurative painting you know with actual people you know yeah and then and then i i i felt like that would like take away take away from the the kind of overall uh what i was trying to i guess communicate with it because people were you know, like if you have a figure in it, people want to know who is that person. <laughs> you right. know, yeah, and then sure. it becomes about there's the whole story, and and I, I wanted it to be about more than that, I guess, for want of a better word. And so I started to include like sculpture as like a stand-in for a figure, um, right? Yes. W- without it having to refer to them, but but to remind us of how we occupy space, and and that would be sort of like you know. Greco-Roman busts and whatever, um, but then I didn't want to refer to that kind of history in that way. 
and I just was thinking about like you know the rep- what is like the the um, the kind of crudest, cheapest, uh, quickest form of uh, repre- representational sculpture. <laughs> And I just thought of like styrofoam heads, you know, yeah. like even like sub mannequin level, like, and, um, what I, I got into those because like, they, they all seemed like these kind of composite faces where like, they were all just like bits of face, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. kind of like how, um, when, you know, they'll find like a skeleton of like, uh, some Neolithic person and, and they'll they'll do like a really crude like discovery channel like cgi of what they thought the person looked like yeah yeah <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it all looks slightly similar yeah. Way, yeah and so i was just thinking about that you know so 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 like you know i'll have these ideas and then i'll, I'll try and think of like you know the the visual vehicle for like talking about it and um so the one day i might just be like oh yeah i need to i need to find the right kind of styrofoam head to paint yeah. And then, you know, and then I might make just a portrait of that. And then I, I might actually put that in like a painting, like a bigger scene with the, um, compared to with an other artwork and objects around it and see how, how that all lands. So is there, um, I mean, what is, what is it like in uh, San Francisco um, for artists then? Do you get out to see much stuff and you know what's going on at the minute i know you said you it, it didn't seem as sort of full on uh as london but is the what's going on out there and what's kind of exciting you at the minute it's a really good it's a, it's a it's interesting cuz like uh you know when i first moved here i was talking to one of my friends and it had been about 6 months and and i said you know i'm starting to get to know people i'm going to openings i'm going to events mm. and then and then he was like, yeah, well, if you go to three more, you'll probably have met everybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. And, um, which didn't, you know, it didn't turn out to be true, but in a way you do, you do see the same people more often than you do in London. Like you might meet another artist in London at a, like an event, really get along mm. and then never see them again, you know? Yeah. And you'll both still be living in the same city, but like, you know, you know how it is and and here like you can form like longer term connections with people and there's like some really good there's some really really good pillars of the community kind of institutions here one is it's like minnesota street projects and it's based around this area of minnesota street where these these kind of philanthropists kind of art collectors uh, like started uh, a large studios building that gives like kind of affordable high quality studios to artists you know they pay for it but it's like a really good uh rate with like long-term leases and then across from that is like a galleries building and that has like i don't know 15 great galleries and um, a few more down the street and then they have like a a large-scale kind of museum uh scale space for like um multi-channel video installations and things like that that the the solo artist does like every kind of six months like takes over the space and does it so there's that um there's a great space called cushion works which is run by jordan stein and i encourage folks to to tune into what what jordan does cushion works is um uh also where i have my studio is in the same building and in it right and he shows like he shows incredible shows of uh, lesser known artists who uh, have done made major accomplishments but haven't gotten major recognition okay. and yeah. um yeah and and has a knack for unearthing like some incredible stories uh of you know a lot of times they're bay bay area based artists who made incredible impact locally but maybe didn't have the gallery representation locally but um, whether the, an activist or um, kind of more, I wouldn't say outsider artist, but more. I was going to think, is that like a dirty word now, outsider? Yeah, well, I think I think it's maybe not not necessarily, but I think that it, it what it does is it it, um, it can 
take away from the the legitimate like accomplishments that they actually had yeah. like they might have been like you know there was an artist um who who made massive contributions to comic books and graphic novels and and that and, that, and but like didn't wouldn't have gotten maybe the recognition from like you know freeze magazine or something like that mm. but when you go see the work it's like it's no less you know accomplished or um maybe not the right word but like the impact that it's made in the in the culture in the sphere that it was in was still like massive you know so yeah yeah um it's just that maybe the the art the art going audience of 2024 might not be aware of them so that it's worth like a revisit you know yeah and then henna and i just had henna my wife henna banyo uh another like who you know is a, is an incredible uh multimedia artist um we had our first kind of exhibition together uh in like since like 2007 right it was like a three-person show um uh with an artist another artist called phil Mizo, um a photographer um and and uh kind of multimedia artist as well uh case more gallery uh which is also in the minnesota street just before we get on to uh x-files land are you um are you getting much time to uh make music at the minute and um and what's what's that sounding like and uh you know are you um are you making stuff on your own or are you playing with other people well i i have a some friends i jam with um and uh i guess that's the best way to describe it um we've been since i moved here we get together and make music sometimes we record sometimes we've played for you know for in front of groups of friends but um it hasn't been you know we've also done some performances we did a performance for uh my you know one of the members is this artist richard T. Walker, who who shows at a, a gallery here called Frankel Gallery, and a mm-hmm. gallery called Kuro in uh, Guadalajara, and um, we did for his solo show in Guadalajara last uh, a year ago in November. We did a performance there um, in front of some of his um, film, and that was really that was really great. Um, and we've been doing performances like that probably since like two thousand and four. Um, off oh, and on okay. yeah um, and besides that I've been trying to learn like when I have time trying to learn piano yes because I see you reposting a lot of um, Philip Glass videos yeah. and <laughs> yeah. I'm a massive Philip Glass fan because, and I thought Dan's cracked here because if you let I, I'm whispering it but it's quite easy to play isn't it the Philip Glass stuff right And but you sound great when you're playing it and uh, and I always show off when I go around someone's house playing that opening or you know uh, metamorphosis or something like that with basically like three chords and uh, but it just sounds beautiful. I'm not in no way downgrading the work of the great Philip Glass, but you can <laughs> you can you can play it and still sound quite good. But I, yeah, uh, it's nice to it's nice to see those videos those videos pop up because it's um I don't know my 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 folks always used to say if you learn the piano you can play anything and i was like oh god it just seemed like a right it's like it's not cool playing the piano you know when you're eight years old you want to play guitar or drums or something but i really wished i'd have put the effort in a bit more you know when i was younger to learn that's it. exactly it because I, I was trying to learn uh opening on the guitar oh. um but you only have I mean, you have two hands but it, it only makes it only makes what one hand does on the piano yeah. And then I was like, and then I was trying to do both parts, but just a little bit of each. And then I was like, oh, I, I need to like, actually, if I want to play some of these songs, I'm, I want to try and learn piano. So I'm like, um, slowly getting to it. I wouldn't say I can, I can play one hand of opening. <laughs> I can't do the left because it's like, I don't know how you do that where it's like a completely different time. Yeah. Um I mean, I did. I did learn. This is such the saddest key, uh, instrument ever. But uh, I, did, I didn't learn piano when I was young. I learned keyboard, which is basically like learn the chords. But I got the timing for that glass one by approaching it more like drumming. So oh yeah, because you play like, drum. Yeah, like the like the high, like doing the hi hat, and then sort of um, dis disassociating what one has to do from the other. But that is, you know, that takes. 
<laughs> takes a while to kind of get your head around it. Maybe next time we're in the same place, would you show me? Oh, yes, defo. Defo. I love it. Oh, shit. Well, yeah, I'll be showing off. I'll be coming around and cracking out that I might have learned another one of his. Uh, another one of his things by that point what i can do is play where it sounds like one of these kind of ambient piano albums that are just kind of meandering nice i can do that like i could sort of fake that yeah i mean my dream is to be a cocktail pianist oh i could see you doing that oh my you know but for my whole life i was like i've just got this thing about and this is a nice segue into the X Files episode because I always want to do a show where I'm either like a cheesy sort of lounge entertainer, or I want to do a comedy show where I was like a Bible Belt kind of missionary, you know, like a preacher. Yeah. Uh, again, both are based around music because you could either do a lounge music or I oh, just find it so intoxicating that kind of gospel, you know. Um, feverish atmosphere mm-hmm. that you have in a like a, in a ministry tent like that um so i mean I, i'm not i've not performed comedy for many years but if i ever come back it'll either be a it'll either be a cocktail singer or it'll be a a, a preacher do one of those shows was like half and half yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah Because you, when I ta- when I asked you to do this, and thank you very much for for watching it and for chatting, you said you'd never seen Dex Files in your life. What was it like coming to this particular episode, uh, you know, fresh? And what did you think about it after you'd watched it? I didn't want to have my first episode that I saw of X Files be this one because I wanted at least a little bit of context for like who who are like M- mm. Mulder and Scully and like what what are they doing? Cause mm. I, I always knew of X Files, and I knew it was like these two FBI agents, and they were doing something about the X Files. I didn't know what the X Files were, but yeah. like, so I just wanted to watch. I watched the pilot, and I watched the the, the second, I guess, episode to right. get kind of the okay. rhythm of it. So, and I, I think that that helped. I'm, I'm glad I did that because it would have been really intense to jump into this <laughs> this one. Um, but yeah, like uh, I, I kind of had that thing where I, I, I figured it would be this way. Where I was like, "Oh, like I really missed out on something here," you know, like right. Um, so I'm definitely gonna go back and not maybe not watch all like what is it like eight nine seasons or something. Yeah, two hundred nineteen episodes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'll do do that, but I'll definitely like. Um, if I don't know what, what I want to watch, I think I'll, I'll go to one of these. But um, I was like, really, I guess the first thing I was taken by was I I didn't, I was surprised by like how kind of um, graphic, I guess, like some of the uh, gore, not gore, but like, like they'll show like dead bodies and dead body parts yeah. and stuff like in a really like, like they had the, the victim of the, um, the, the thing that happens at the beginning, like the the arm comes out in the hand, and it's like, whoa, that was that on just normal TV, like back then. <laughs> yeah, I guess we should say um, that this is uh, season one, episode eighteen, uh, Miracle Man, and uh, the idea behind the episode is that Mulder and Scully receive this videotape of a faith healer who's um, latest patient, for want of a better word, has died mysteriously, and the agents have to. Uh, go and kind of investigate that and they realised that the ministry involved might be covering up some murders involved. But you do have this there's a great opening, really quick actually, there's a building on fire uh, firefighters taking people out of the building and then a pastor turns up with his young son, the son's about eight, eight years old and um, goes over to a badly uh, burnt dead body Well it's a body and, bag uh, first yeah, if that's it. And then right. the kid yes. unzips it, and it'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the, the firefighter's going, I don't know what you did, because he's dead. And the pastor goes, well, it, we can't do any harm then, can we? And then uh, this boy touches the body, says a few words, and the the eyes are the, are the eyes open, or his, his hand clutches, the dead the dead body's hand clutches uh, the boy's hand and, and comes awake. And then, and then we get the... 
and then we get the title sequence so it's 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 a good i think this is a great episode actually you know i've been watched quite a few of them now this is really i mean i don't know how because it wasn't filmed in where's it set tennessee it wasn't filmed there it was, it was this particular one was it's usually filmed in canada but this particular one was filmed in um british columbia i think so i mean some of the accents are a bit off <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 or like they're really tr- uh you know it feels like a stage play like level of accent yeah uh everybody's trying the hardest but i did um i mean it's like a lot of the episodes it moves really quickly because it has to as well as this them Mulder and Scully investigating this uh this healer you've also got this background of Mulder's sister and um his his sister who was was or wasn't abducted by aliens you know he starts seeing his sister so you've got this whole kind of guilt thing going in the background which I thought was I mean did you get that from the first two episodes as well that he's that his sister's been abducted or we think she's been abducted by aliens i didn't remember that like i didn't recall that that being a thing he just like in the i just he he from the beginning from the first episode like the first time you see him he's definitely like he knows what's up (laughs) (laughs) regarding aliens you know like he knows he knows what's going on as and i hope you do watch more of it because it's he's kind of shoots himself in the foot um a lot uh Mulder a lot of these cases end with him killing somebody oh really and basically ruining any evidence that there is you know an afterlife or some aliens or faith healing or vampires so he's like he's in this perpetual horrible limbo that he can never resolve He's always going to be in the X Files loop, and it's, I'm starting to feel sorry for the guy now. <laughs> but then there wouldn't be another episode, I guess. No, no, I, I guess, and I guess that was right. And it, it's why it becomes more and more like painful when you have um, there's an informer character called Deep Throat, and then another informer character called Mister X. But they they only give like little snippets of information. They don't give the whole story, so it's like. It's almost like treating Mulder like a child. And I think at one point, Deep Throat does say, stop acting like a teenager. And I feel a bit like it's because you are treating him like a teenager. You're really giving him like little bits of the puzzle. You work it out, Mulder. Go on, you, you can do it. You can figure out what's going on here. And it's like, you could have just told him. It saved us all a lot of time, but, but they never will. And I guess you're right. We, we wouldn't have had a TV show then. But, you know, I, I enjoyed that. What I also enjoyed is I liked the... Um, that early on in the episode we get just after the credits we get like some video footage which we don't know is video footage um, of this ministry and someone yeah it's really intense so that was but that was great and it does that a lot of the X-Files is it's like plays with uh, TV mediums and um, you know I guess a lot of people probably all had um, video cameras at the time Mm. you know 90s a big boom for video cameras so that was probably at the front of, of the filmmaker's mind as well. It's like, well, let's do that because that's an immediate sort of way of everybody would be able would have a, a, a video camera or would know would know this and it would be really immediate. So I liked that little kind of almost like Hanukkah. You know, you're watching this this chaotic scene and then the tape stops and then it, the camera pulls out and Scully's talking talking you through you know what's going on. So I enjoyed that. Um, and of course, I really liked uh, the kind of henchman Leonard Vance. Oh scares. my god! Do you know, like, immediately, like, for one, like, I was like, wait, all the other like um, makeup and uh, sort of special effects, like, kind of um, bodies and kind of creepy things that they show are done really well, but like his makeup is really not. It's really yeah. not. Really not. And it made me it made me think of uh, do, do you remember that the character um, from the Mighty Boosh, uh, Bob Fossil? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, he was like an American <laughs> yeah. actor. Uh, I forgot the guy's Rich name. Fulcher, Rich Fulcher. Rich Holt. Rich Fulcher. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, oh my god, I could totally see like Bob Fossil like in this guy. Just <laughs> just the total comedy, like unintentional. 
unintentionally funny. Like it's yeah. so it's so over the top. It's like whoa, hey guy, with your sunglasses and your fedora. Yeah, it's so conspicuous. <laughs> and he doesn't talk for like the first half the episode. Yeah, because I couldn't really figure out. <sighs> this is also an issue with the X Files is you're kind of in too deep by like the 35 minute mark to start asking questions. Yeah, yeah. That you happened know. to me. I actually had to go back. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, wait, no oh, is that the guy? I was like, oh, is he the guy from the beginning who he saved? Oh, mate, I, is it that? I guess it is that. Yeah. Yeah, it is that. Yeah, I think he's, um, he's the one. Yes. And, um, and that he's responsible for it. Um, but I don't really know why. Like, what's his... I don't really know what his, like, point is, why he's killing people, because he's so... Is it he's so obsessed with this idea that the the Hartley, the kid, the faith of the character, could be um, a genuine phenomenon, that he wants to kind of keep perpetuating it? Oh. Or, See, I couldn't tell I, if he... W- like, okay... So I was going to ask you this, <laughs> and now you know, I don't think you know, but like, is he, because it turns out in the end that he wasn't actually killing these people. It was Bob Fossil, or I mean, uh, Leonard Vance. Uh, it was it was that guy who was, he was putting cyanide, he was giving the cyanide to the people, right? Yes, that's it, yeah. So... so so that's what's killing them. But like, what wasn't clear to me was, was he actually, originally, was he healing people? Like, le- yeah, legitimately. Right. Yeah. And well, if he is the person who's been resurrected from the beginning, then yes, I guess. Um. <laughs> but that's, I guess that's quite nice. And that's like, because there's another episode where uh, the fire one. X Files. That's quite a good one. You should watch that. That um, where there's like a fire starter, and he's got this ridiculous British accent. I did want to watch that. It's great. It's great. It's like Mulder's got this British girlfriend, and it it all takes place in Britain, and yeah, it's really fun. But I'll, with that, it's like he does start some fires, but then other fires he needs a bit of help with it. So I wonder if there's an element to that where it's like there is a kernel of strange phenomenon here but in order to keep the machinery going then this len advanced character has had to you know just poison a few people along the way and that's i quite like that as an idea that you know you've got that the the capitalism you know consumer or just money at the end of the day is still like pushing this along you know and and, and the and the and the faith healer character is just as much of a part of that as any of the kind of parishioners really is as much of a sort of victim uh, as anybody else. So that's quite that's quite nice. And I like the locusts. I thought that was quite a good scene with the. Oh yeah, that really creeped know. me out. <laughs> that that was again. That was like one of those. This part's really realistic, and I'm like really impressed by it. And I was really impressed by like the beginning scene with the fire and like how you know gruesome that was. It felt like it's kind of shockingly real. And then there'll be things yeah. like, like when you see uh, when you see um, Mulder, when you see his sister, the ghost of his sister, it looks just like a kid with a with a really bad wig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just like, <laughs> but yeah. So I I didn't really, but then he knew about he knew about his sister. Like how? Yeah, uh, that was quite cool, wasn't it? That was um, so that scene happened in the bar. And they've come to, well, the sheriff's come to arrest the faith healer, the young faith healer, and Mulder and Scully have tagged along as well. And then, yeah, the faith healer called Samuel says to Mulder that, you know, you've lost someone, you've lost a sister. But you could read that as like cold reading, couldn't you? You know, like that um, sort of sideshow uh, psychics do. So I I, I quite liked how that was played, that that he could have just, again there's an element of showmanship in the whole thing where it's like maybe maybe you can maybe once did something magical did happen but the rest of the time it's just a parlor trick it's just a way of um you know navigating his life so i quite liked that but i don't know are you would you say you were 
you know, were you a believer in these things? Not, let's not say faith healing, but, you know, are you, are you, um, are you someone who would think twice about going in a dark room? Because there's, I mean, I think probably we all are, but, you know, are you, are you open to the idea of ghosts and aliens and, and that sort of thing? Um, maybe not, maybe not really in this way, but like, mm. I guess, I guess um, it's another another show, but like um, I watched The Curse. Have you seen The Curse? I've watched the first episode of it, and I, I, I need to find a time and place where I can hack watching any more of it. I, I also was like, I don't want to watch this, um, but I stuck with it, and I was like really glad I did. Like really, really glad. I think it's like one of the best things I've seen in a long time. Oh, great! Yeah, I highly recommend it. But like. Um, when that make that your question makes me think about this because uh, like the premise of the show, it it came from Nathan Fielder uh, when he first moved to America from Canada. He had to get a, a mobile phone, right. and he went. He was going into a shop, and on the way into the shop, there was a woman on the street uh, who was uh, uh, asking for money, and he didn't have any money. Um, right. And he said, "No, I'm sorry, I don't have any." And then, and then she said, "Well, I curse you." And, right. and he just kind of like, "Oh yeah, whatever," and went into the the store. But uh, the whole time he's like waiting to get his phone, he couldn't get this curse out of his head. He's like, "What if I am cursed?" He's like, "I don't really yeah. believe in it," but like it, it wouldn't leave him. So like when he came out, he actually went to a cash machine and got some money and gave it to the woman and said, "Like here's some money." And she's like, thanks. And he said, D- do, you st- do I still have the curse? And she said, no, no, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like kind of the, how the premise of the show came about. And like, yeah. uh, but so in that regard, like if, if someone's, I tried to put myself in his shoes. I think if someone said that to me, it would also play on my mind. So yeah. I wouldn't think I believe in it. But like if it comes to you in like a direct way like that, then I start to question things yeah just just to be safe is 50 quid exactly yeah yeah like i might not believe in it but i would probably consider the um the investment believe me is written and edited by me chris boyd with production support from steve marshall the music is by johnny boyle and our logo is by russ brown see you out there next time